Hello and welcome to CIA Files, true stories of U.S. intelligence. Now, I'm trying different things out, you know, I'm still trying to find that hook for bringing us into the show. Thanks for joining us. I am, as always, Topher M. Ford. As always, I have my co-host, Brandon Gibbons, and today is extra special because we have a third person with us. You may recognize from our proper episodes the voice of Joshua Travis. Joshua, what up? What up, yo? Great to be here. I'm excited to, excited to be on live. It's a fun new ex- adventure. Great to have you. Great to have you, man. So today, as I was saying before we started recording, today's subject, I'm feeling a little froggy, like a little, just slightly aggressive, maybe. I don't know. I've been picking on people, and I think it's because we are, uh, our subject for today is a huge nerd. He's probably like top nerd. If there was a nerd Olympics, this guy would get it the gold medal probably and it, it's got me in the mood for making pulling wedgies uh stealing lunch money uh punching people in the arm all of that good stuff uh and our subject today is clifford stoll um it's a, a little it's a wacky story that i've been wanting to cover for a little while now and uh yeah we're going to we're going to talk about this guy he was an astronomer turned IT uh guy in the early days of the internet uh and he is he caught the first or at least what we could tell is the first uh maybe documented case of a hacker breaking into government databases he found it and he figured out how to catch this person. Um, was it Matthew Broderick? It was Matthew Broderick. <laughs> they, caught, they caught that. They caught him. Oh, I think Do I saw that movie. To... I'm picturing like the producers, Matthew Broderick, though. <laughs> oh yeah, well, it's. Uh, uh, I might have the actor wrong, but the one where I think it was one of his first movies and War Games. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah War Games, yeah, it's a yeah. classic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Do you want to play a game? Yeah. This is exactly like war games, except no artificial intelligence and no Matthew Broderick. Uh, it's exactly like war games, only very different. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's accurate. Um, speaking of old internet, this story happened in 1986. We were just talking, we were having some, uh, issues with getting all the, uh, chat invites out and, uh, it's a good time. I th- I want to mention that Brandon still has his old Hotmail account, <laughs> yeah, probably his very first email account, and still uses it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 my name. And <laughs> I'm so I, jealous. I can't I can't give it up. You know, it's like old school. I was, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I was so jealous, man. <laughs> I was there at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was there when it all began. My name is one of the first at Hotmail.com. <laughs> yeah. See, I used, to I, have dead, I used to have Deadly Ninja at Hotmail.com. No numbers or anything. It was old. Now I lost it after they switched to MSN because I forgot my password and they wouldn't give it to me. Aww. What a bunch of fuckers. Oh, yeah, I, I still regret missing out on uh, not getting a big penis 69 at Hotmail.com. I feel like I really missed an opportunity with what, that. What, did you do that for Google when that, that when you had the chance? No, no. Again, I I slipped up. What about Yahoo? No, you, you know what? Remember Yahoo? Yeah, uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, enough of this tomfoolery. I say uh, we get into this thing because I actually wrote some stuff uh, on this. All right. Uh, So Clifford Stoll, he is an American astronomer and author and teacher and many other things. Um, He earned his bachelor's degree in astronomy from the University of Buffalo in 1973, where he also participated in the school's electronic music lab 
and was mentored by the legendary Robert Moog. If you, Josh, I know oh, you what? know who he was. Yeah. Nice. I did not expect that crossover. <laughs> I know. It's, uh, I was surprised to see that too. Robert Moog, for those of you who don't know, uh, invented some of the very first, uh, uh, synthesizers, uh, keyboard synthesizers. Um, the Moog synthesizer is, I mean, now there, there are tons of different ones, different models, but they're like industry standard for synthesizers. And he made some of the first ones and it had a huge impact on eighties music. Um, that pop sound when you started hearing all of that, elect those electronic elements and the eighties hits, that was Robert Moog. And Clifford Stoll uh, studied under him. And then after that, um, Stoll earned his PhD from the University of Arizona in uh, 1980. He loves describing himself as a sort of uh, jack of all trades. In an interview with Wired, he said, To a mathematician, I'm a pretty good physicist. To a physicist, I'm a fairly good computer maven. To real computer jocks, they know me as somebody who's a good writer. To people who know how to write, I'm a really good mathematician. Good job, Josh. It's nice to have you uh, around for these. Yeah, I'm going to try to do my best in like nerd voice in honor of this guy. <laughs> oh, I'll do. I my, mean, Professor Frank from The Simpsons. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. <yikes. laughs> you know what's all right? So, which is a, just Jerry Lewis. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> he uh, uh, still still talks about uh, this whole experience to now. Even now, um, he gives speeches on it and stuff. And I watched a few of them on YouTube, and yeah, he sounds exactly as nerdy as you think he does. <laughs> um, his hair is there. I mean, it's just a, his hair just looks like a thing that he's had for a long time. <laughs> Uh, and um yeah he's... you know how to paint a picture chris <laughs> that's, 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 that's the single worst description of hair i've ever heard i just mean it's just it just <laughs> it just exists i don't think that he's like even all real. over the place right isn't it kind of like um yeah. busy and 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 yeah he... the einstein einstein kind of out there looks like he's stuck his finger in a light bulb or something and yeah. well uh, it, Unkempt. It, it looks like he stuck his finger in a light bulb in 1992 and hasn't <laughs> washed his hair since then. That's what it looks like. Nice. Um, oh, you're bullying the poor man. Well, I told you. Hey, he's, he's in bully mode, bro. This, yeah. Get on my level, bro. <laughs> anyway, ooh, I am feeling froggy today. Uh, afterward, he took a job at the Lawrence Berkeley National Library in the IT department. It wasn't his first choice for a career, but he took it anyway, uh, probably for, you know, the money, because that's why people take <laughs> jobs. Yes. Uh, so he is working in a little closet office um, at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Library. Um and uh, his boss, in 1986, his boss brought him a problem. So the lab sold access to its computer network for somewhere around $5 a minute. Um, Stoll's huh. boss. Yeah, I know. It was really expensive. Yeah, with uh, inflation, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, was, it worked out to be about $300 an hour. Uh, Stoll's boss had come across 75 cents worth of access that hadn't been paid for, which was about nine seconds. Uh, his boss asked him if he could find out who owed them, you know, the three quarters. So oh, nice. Uh, the error was puzzling and Stoll became fixated on solving it because like I mentioned, nerd, Stoll borrowed a bunch of extra computer equipment to bring into his office to isolate this mysterious user uh, who mainly seemed to be active during lunchtime uh, Stoll started sleeping in his office so he could be present if the hacker accessed the system during his off hours. This made his then girlfriend unhappy so he got a pager and connected it to his system so that he'd get a page if they showed up. 
Uh, Wire described what this time for Stoll was like. Just as much as its technical lessons, the cuckoo's egg captures a deeply personal side of the job of hacker training, too. The long hours, friction with bosses, federal agents who demand to be briefed on discoveries without sharing their own information, and tensions with loved ones. Stoll's then-girlfriend, now ex-wife, didn't always appreciate the night sleeping under his desk to hunt an invisible white whale. And... uh that quote there mentioned the cuckoo's egg we're going to come back to that in a bit that is the book that Stoll wrote after the effect uh, after the, all this happened that became uh, sort of the bible for cybersecurity. so anyway he finally managed to isolate the hacker and he created an early key logging program and used some uh, hardware to monitor what the hacker was doing in their network. He discovered that the hacker was actually accessing government databases, including those of the army, the CIA, along with new numerous military and defense groups. And the hacker seemed especially interested in files on nuclear subjects and on the strategic defense initiative or the SDI. Uh, Brandon, do you know much about the SDI? You- Star Wars. I'll snap. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was yeah. Like uh, Reagan and the crew were really big on creating a missile defense shield uh, to protect the U.S. from a nuclear strike, and the Soviet Union didn't much care for that because, uh, well, <laughs> well, the, those, yeah. ex- those missiles are expensive. Yeah, <laughs> they don't want to. Get, they don't want to get shot down. Yeah, understandable reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I spend millions of dollars on a nuclear missile. I want it to kill people. I don't want right. it to get blown up in space. Yeah, it's, well, a, it's know, a real buzz kill. <laughs> yeah, when you spend all that million, then it it doesn't do what you wanted it to do. Uh, it ends up being the thorn in uh, Gorbachev's side when, well, when Reagan and Gorbachev are discussing um, denuclearization. Uh, the Americans didn't really trust him. They thought, you know, all the liberalization there is, it's a trap. It's a trick. He's just, he's just trying to get us to lower our defenses. That's a very, that's a very common response, American (laughs) response to every (laughs) Russian, every Soviet thing ever. (laughs) It's a trap. Or Star Wars stuff. I tell you what, the nerd stuff is, it's more intense than I thought it would be. (laughs) <laughs> Dirts go hard, dude. Um, right on. Yeah. Okay. Star Wars, of course. Star Wars. <laughs> uh, which, speaking of wasting, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars on something that doesn't work, that's, <laughs> there's Star yeah, Wars. I'm sure we got plenty of technology out of that. That was very helpful. I mean, so much of our technology and economy is based on. Oh yeah, you know, sort of spinning uh, the GPS. I mean the pff, Unix and you know, all this software programming. Yeah, that's and a good point. Even if a lot they of, didn't, a lot of stuff up... from the Roswell craft. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I didn't wink, say wink. that <laughs> because so hum- hum- humans are incapable of coming up with right. <laughs> There's no way it had to be aliens. Have right. you met people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you say it like that. All right. So Stoll took his findings to Army officials who were initially somewhat dismissive. He informed the CIA that someone had been trying to look through their systems. And they sent a couple of guys over to interview Stoll. And they ended up not taking it too seriously either. He contacted the FBI, the, N- the NSA, and the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. But the hacker hadn't accessed any classified information yet, so they didn't see to see the need to worry about it. Even though all of this stuff he was accessing was, like, supposed to be hidden behind, uh, you know, like a security login. But this was, you know, this was the early days, and the Internet was still new, and I'm sure, you know three-fourths, four-fifths of the people that he talked to barely, like they were probably just annoyed that they had to deal with computers. (laughs) (laughs) And so they're like, somebody's 
you somebody's using our computer. Oh no, I don't give a shit. Get out of here. <laughs> I've got anyway, scotch to drink. Yeah. <laughs> These cigars aren't going to smoke themselves. <laughs> uh, so they were just like, eh, whatever, you know. So Stoll, still highly fixated, uh, continued the search on his own over the course of 10 months. And with the help of a lot of other people, he tracked the hacker's line. The hacker had routed their connection through a number of other communications companies, uh, making the process incredibly difficult. It was like a VPN. He made, he made yeah, the, the first uh, VPN. Yeah, so, yeah, sorta. I mean, a VPN is like a tunnel and that you can't <laughs> see the information unless you're on one end or the other. Um, but this is more like, you know, the person is connecting to uh, the internet. Uh, you know, well, it was called ARPANET back then. Yep, They're connecting to ARPANET, and then he's like uh, connecting at this place and then from that place he's connecting to a different place and then from that place he's connecting to a different place so that by the time he finally gets to the uh databases he wants to hack uh it's really hard to know where he's actually coming from um thanks now you know nowadays thanks to movies and tv shows everybody is kind of used to these concepts like bouncing calls around networks and tracing those calls trace that call you know, yeah. hey, you gotta uh, be on for for a minute and two seconds. Keep him right. on the line for sixty yeah. seconds. Stall, stall. Ask him about his mother. Yeah. Um. But in 1986, of course, this was all brand new. Nobody had thought about even the need for this. Not unless you know how to actually do it. Uh, so there weren't any protocols for dealing with it. Uh, so Stroll had to trace the hacker by enlisting the help of different people at different telephone companies which also had its own problems. You know, there would be jurisdiction issues. He got a warrant in um, wherever he was. I can't remember which state it was he was in, but he got a warrant. Oh, he the initial warrant was in Virginia because uh, one of the last nodes on the hacker's route was uh, in Langley. Langley, yeah. But the, you know, like when they traced that connection to a different state, all of a sudden, that warrant is not sufficient anymore. <laughs> so they have to like go through the oh, process dude. of getting that telephone company to, you know, give them access. So it's like the telephone companies, in, a, in a, at least a couple of the cases, were like, "All right, we found the, you know, we found the source," and they go, "Cool, where is it?" And they go, "We can't tell you." <laughs> like, well. <laughs> Thanks for helping. Uh, we <laughs> maybe should have told us before we spent, you know, 10 hours on the phone with you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it'll but, be fine. Um, but they eventually, you know, they worked through all of that. But that's part of why it took almost a year for this to happen. Um, uh, and part of the problem was also, like we were mentioning just a second ago, the amount of time it takes to trace the hacker's connection, you know, and if they're not on the line long enough, and we're probably talking a lot more than just 60 or 90 seconds, you know, because this is in the days of early, early dial up. <laughs> um, so part of the problem was the amount of time it took. Uh, so Stoll came up with an idea, create a fake department within the lab to fulfill a fake contract with the uh, strategic defense initiative. And then he created a trove of fake documents full of bureaucraties to catch the hunt hackers' attention and keep them connected long enough to trace them. A honeypot. Yes. Yep. He invented the honeypot, at least in, uh, you know, digital, the digital form. And uh, what's interesting, he said that he and his girlfriend came up with the idea while they were showering together. And so they called, they decided to call it Operation Showerhead. <laughs> Aw. Which, <laughs> yeah, it's, it might be cute, but it also might be a double entendre. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe. Probably not, though. We're still talking about nerds. This guy's a regular George Hunter White. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, when I saw that about him having a girlfriend, I was like, oh, nice. Every pot really does find a lid. 
<laughs> I'm still being mean. That's what I know, Brandon. You're going to say all oh, a lot, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So they finally tracked this person down after a year. The hacker turned out to be a German man named Marcus Hess. He worked with a small group of hackers there in Germany to uh, East track Germany? down and. Was this East Germany? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> now that you mention it. Um, okay. you, you can edit that out. I won't ask it interrupt. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, let's look it, it says, up. It says they sold it to the KGB, so probably East Germany. He was in um, Hanover. Oh, that's West Germany. You're so smart, Brandon. <laughs> You're not a nerd, are you? Oh, you know I am. Oh, that's, yeah, that's true. It's all right. Uh, so Marcus Hess, as like I said, he worked with a small group of hackers there to find sensitive U.S. intelligence, uh, which they then sold to the KGB. He Hess had been using a connection at the University of Bremen uh, there in Germany to gain access to ARPANET, which I said before, that's the precursor to the World Wide Web which was developed by the Department of Defense. And they were also accessing Milnet, which was a similar network for military use. Hess was found and arrested. Uh, he was found guilty of espionage, for which he was given a 20-month suspended sentence. <laughs> That's like hey, the definition of a slap on the wrist. <laughs> right? Like, well, hey, like I said, I think that, you know, they went light... A, because they probably didn't really understand, you know. Yeah, it's, they're it's like, none of us know what, none of us understand what you did. So, you know. <laughs> Watch a computer. And um, that, and also, I think that while they, t they, you know, they nabbed a ton of files, they didn't actually get anything classified. So. Ah, uh, yeah. Um. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, uh, like you were mentioning, Brandon, the technology that gets developed along uh, while they're working on their lofty goals. Uh, Stoll did the same thing, uh, figuring out each step as he went along this process, searching for the hacker. He inadvertently created what would become standard practices in modern cybersecurity. After his cyber adventure, Stoll wrote a book called the Cuckoo's Egg, Tracking a Spy Through the Maze of Computer Espionage. Uh, it, it became a big hit. It went on to serve as the first blueprint for cybersecurity. Uh, a cybersecurity expert explained how important Stoll's book was in the previously mentioned Wired article. The Cuckoo's Egg documented so many of the methods we now use to deal with high-end intruders, says Richard Betrick a well-known security guru who has worked on incident response and network monitoring at companies like CoreLight and FireEye. You can see in the book almost everything you need to do in an incident. The mindset, the thoroughness, the commitment to it. It's all there. So Stoll's work uh, tracking the German hacker group inspired Lawrence Livermore National Labs, the sister organization to Stoll's employer, uh, decided to study and develop more robust cybersecurity protocols and tools to keep ha hackers out of their network. Uh, from the Wired article again. An engineer there, Todd Huberlane, was given a grant to build the world's first network security monitoring software. You could literally say that Cliff Stoll kickstarted the entire intrusion detection field. We essentially automated in software much of what Stoll was doing, Huberlane says. Once I had our tools turned on, we saw people every day trying to hack our network and sometimes succeeding. An entire crime wave was happening and no one was aware of it. So, I mean, it kind of sounds like he, you know, he found one roach and uncovered like a whole infestation. <laughs> um, but yeah, the hackers are a lot like roaches. Uh, I wonder where they're. I'm, oh, go ahead. I was, it's just amazing to me that there were that many so soon. It was like just and nerds, man, nerds. <laughs> yeah. 
like probably a bunch of like big Rick Wakeman fans really into synthesizers, which tracks because <laughs> it was so you had to know computers back then to work with synthesizers. So I can just picture these guys in their little rooms with their funnions hacking into the ARPANET before it was cool. Before it was cool. Well, and you know, you, how many years before Angelina Jolie made it cool? <laughs> At least a good 10. She wasn't <laughs> hacking the Gibson until like the mid 90s. Um, well, and you know, and actually you mentioned hackers that plays into what I was just about to say. Um, hackers came along before computers um, because I think, and I'm, I'm, you know, like I say many times, I'm not an expert on this, but I think that the first hackers that, uh, you know, like popped up in the public were hacking the the phone lines you know back when uh, okay. uh, AT&T Ma Bell had a monopoly on the system and they were figuring out that the whole system was based on sounds you know like different tones mm-hmm. yeah. um and it was possible to pick up your phone and if you knew how to mani- you know like how to make the right tones <laughs> you could <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yep. you could you could get into um well in these cases you, you weren't getting into databases to read uh files but you would be able to make free long distance phone calls yeah you can go you past could, the switch like bypass the switch so that you can just go on the y- line yeah um that that showed up in the movie Hackers with those two uh, little guys who had like a a cassette player that they'd play into their yeah. in the to the payphone and they'd be able to call out of the country. I forgot um, about that. There's also a a really cool audio drama uh, podcast thing on uh, Audible called uh, I think it's called Freaks. Freaks and Geeks is not a documentary, Chris. No, not Freaks and Geeks. Freaks, spelled P-H-R-E-A-K-S. Oh, Jesus. Uh, As in uh, phone, Hmm. I guess. Um, Oh, oh, Jesus. (laughs) They were called, well, I think they were called uh, phone (laughs) freaks or freakers. Like, that's the, that's part of the, like, the, the. That's the terminology that they were. You know, your words with the P-H for the F uh, often come from Greek. In fact, I think pretty much all of them do. So there you go. Does that Thanks. go for fat? Like, whoa, that's fat. Uh, oh, with the pH and fat? That one? No, yeah, was, no, no. Was that, that a Grecian was, term? No, that was, <laughs> sure. that, was not a, that was not a Grecian term. Yeah, <laughs> so- Socrates' I, reasoning is fat, uh, bro. And, but yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a podcast series on Audible. Um, it's pretty good. It's got Christian Slater's in it and some other, like, Fairly famous voices. Um, anyway, that's unrelated. Uh, all right, I'll here, Christian Slater. Make sure to give us a shout out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christian Slater. We know you're a big uh, listener of the show. <laughs> yeah, I love you and pump up the volume, man. No doubt, it's classic. When are we going to get the sequel? You were totally gleaming the cube, my friend. Pump up the volume two. Turn. Can you turn it down a little? Tap. Come pump on. Down. Pump down the volume, huh? <laughs> Uh, I've had that uh, point. That's rough. That's rough. Pump up the volume too. Get off my lawn. <laughs> right, right. He's just got a podcast. Like he's like Alex Jones, just like spewing vitriol. Yeah. So, um, you know that. So, what's Clifford stole up to these days? Um, I kind of get the feeling that Clifford stole maybe a have a little bit of a ADHD. Um, maybe I think that because I have ADHD and so I project, but like he bounced around from one fixation to another, um, after this deal in cybersecurity, um, you know, this particular incident, he, uh, you know, like he didn't stay in cybersecurity for very long. He just fixed this one particular problem. Uh, which revolutionized an industry 
And then he moved on to other stuff, you know, because it sounds like he just likes bouncing around. Um, you know, he's he moved on from there to electronic music, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, did he go on? Did he do? Did he release anything that you know of? I don't know. Oh. I haven't seen any mentions of him. I'll have to look that stuff. up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that astronomy. He got back to astronomy. Um, writing. He wrote. Uh, you know, he wrote the Cuckoo's Nest, and he's written other books. Um, and uh, mathematics is one of his big passions, and he uh, he makes and sells uh, something called a Klein bottle. So. Uh, the sales from like the cuckoo's nest freed him up financially to be able to spend his time doing whatever he wants, basically. And he became obsessed with these Klein bottles, which you'll have to, it's K L E I N. You have to look it up. Um, it's basically this, uh, bottle where one end kind of loops in on itself. Uh, I, I can't describe how it looks. Uh, I, you'd have to look it up, but what makes it um, special is that at least uh, according like geometrically, it doesn't have an inside or an outside. It's just one continuous surface. You know, it's kind of like a Mobius strip, except like a full 3d thing, not just like a 2d plane. Um, so he sell he buys and sells those, um, I don't think he brings in nearly as much money doing that. But um, yeah, what 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 was the purpose of that? It's cool. The Klein bottle. It's just yeah. a it's just a, 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 um, a novelty. Yeah, just a thing it's like just the, a, like Newton's cradle or something like that. Yeah, it's just like a gotcha. little uh, curious object to own. Right. Um, Live action MC Escher. Yeah, and so <laughs> this I thought this was interesting. Um, like I, you know, I've said over and over again this episode, Clifford Stoll is a huge, huge nerd. Uh, and I feel like the ultimate evidence of that came during the wide, the wired interview. Um, you know, the, the interviewer, the writer was there in his office with him and Stoll like raised up his desk. It was on hinges or something. He raised his desk up. And it revealed that he had a very short hidden door in his wall behind his desk. Uh, he opened it up and this a small, uh, I'm guessing like two foot by two foot robot on wheels came out that of the wall. <laughs> and it had like a camera in it and Stoll had, you know, he could uh, camera view and controls. And he steered the robot back into the hole and into a storage space that he has built on the other side of his wall full of hundreds of boxes of Klein bottles that he's made. And he <laughs> uses the robot to fetch one when he needs one. That is some of the nerdiest <laughs> shit I've ever heard. That's really cool, though. Right? <laughs> yeah, yes, that, I, is... that is top nerd. <laughs> I mean, because... You obviously, if that's what you're doing, you know, you can just put them in a shell on a shelf somewhere. Right. Right. Yeah. What just is the, this like? It's you know, like... Look, I'm going to find the hardest possible solution <laughs> to <laughs> storing these bottles. I'm going to put them behind the wall where the only way to access them is with the remote control robot I built. Well, it's a cover. You go further back in that storage room, there's just kilos and kilos of cocaine. Oh, like, that's the, the one drug I could see him doing because he is energetic. And he this is, is my robot, Cokie. <laughs> he needed an excuse to make a robot. How do I right, justify right. making a robot? Well, <laughs> right. I, mean, like, right. I, mean, I, I really, well, really want to make to take the wall down to put my stuff. Right. It's a whole thing. It's like he he revolutionized cybersecurity and Amazon warehouse technology. <laughs> it's gonna so. take our jobs. Um, so, it's funny talking about the drugs too, because this whole time I've been picturing Gail Bedecker from Breaking Bad as this. Oh dude. right, oh, yeah. <laughs> like that's like that's this dude, <laughs> just eccentric. 
right. eccentric genius. <laughs> Except uh, that guy in Breaking Bad was, you know, like well spoken and sort of uh, s- together, you know, uh, subdued. And Clifford Stoll is. He seems to be pretty active. Oy, oy, oy. Like I saw him giving a speech, a presentation to like a group of cybersecurity people. And uh, he's there at this massive group wearing like uh, like a what's the uh, crap. Now I can't think of it um, like a. What are those shirts that we wore in the '90s that everybody wore the the plaid flannel? Flannel, flannel. Yeah, he's like he's wearing a big flannel shirt, button down shirt that's about three sizes too big for him, <laughs> and pants that don't fit, and uh, you know his hair, which we've already covered at length, and he's like pulls out like I swear to God, a really old overhead projector. To give his presentation. Hey, if it works, it works, you know? Right? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. what's crazy about it. This was like just a couple of years ago that he did this. <laughs> he got out the West Virginia he had a PowerPoint. huge, huge screen behind him. I love this dude. <laughs> but he, he busts out the overhead projector and a bunch of yellowed from age transparencies. I'm surprised he didn't have the robot bring it out. And then he says, Aww, "That would have been like, like an '80s show, right?" Yeah. And then but, he's like, "You know, you guys brought me here to, uh, but I don't know near as much about this stuff as you guys do. But I will tell you this story." And then proceeded to, you know, like rehash this this story here for what I imagine was the millionth time. And God bless him. He, <laughs> he was like enthusiastic about it. Oh, it's, I mean, I've been, you know, like sometimes like bands, they get their one hit and they get sick of playing it, you know? Right. Right. Like, uh, I did, I did, a, went on a couple of short tours in a band. Uh, we were playing with Joe Jack Talcum from the dead milkman. Really nice guy. Super nice. Um, and we'd go to these different places and he would play like some of his solo stuff. And he'd also play some dead milkman songs. And I remember him asking my friend who was like the show um, promoter and everything. Do we have to play punk rock girl again? He's like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. 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 That would, yeah, but that not would Clifford Stoll. Clifford <laughs> Stoll is like still bringing out his, uh, punk rock girl his you know like don't stop believing that's right man you play the hits man the people are there to hear the hits huh? he's yeah I, wow. I i respect that but um yeah i couldn't I, but in his speeches he warns them like you know i'm gonna be bouncing all over the place so it's likely i'm gonna get off topic <laughs> a few times <laughs> self-awareness Which, is important well, what's the point we'll get there when we get there yeah <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I have not read uh, the cuckoo's e- the cuckoo's egg. I think I called it the cuckoo's nest in a few places. It is the cuckoo's egg. It's a great title. Yeah, it is because it's about the you know like how the cuckoo would lay their ne- eggs in other birds' nests so that the other birds would raise their eggs for them. Uh, I guess it's a reference to the hacker. So um, that's that's weird. So it's like like cuckoos are like the deadbeat dads of the bird world. Yeah, basically, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he seems to be doing pretty well. He seems to, you know, like like I said, it, it, it looks like he made his money from his first book. And since then, he's just been living the dream, the nerd, the nerd, the nerdiest dream that's ever been dreamed. Oh, um, that's awesome! Yeah. Well, well, John, yeah, Mc- I'm, I'm happy for him. Oh right? yeah, seriously, it's nice to have a happy ending on the show every once in a while. It's yeah, kind of rare with CIA stories. Yeah, it was a happy ending for him and for the hacker who was given a light slap on the wrist, and for John McAfee who built an empire off of his work. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, that weirdo. He, 
he didn't get a happy ending, but he didn't deserve a happy ending either. So, oh, that's right, I forgot about that. Yeah, um, and one uh, another little side note that I just remembered that I didn't mention. Um, they confirmed that he had been selling information to the CIA by when they set up that what, to the CIA or KGB. I'm sorry, when they sold information to the KGB, good catch there. We're, uh, we'll sell it right back to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, they had put up, they had put in there an address saying, like, you know, to confirm this for confirmation of this information right to this address and they got a letter from a you know from the kgb i mean it wasn't postmarked kgb it was, <laughs> it was, hello but, <laughs> hello this is the kgb uh we noticed this information here is this legit <laughs> just wondering <laughs> not that we have a hacker in your system or anything we just uh, heard some. we heard some things yeah what are you guys up to um so yeah that's clifford stoll still rocking it um weird just well i say weird that kind of has i don't know it maybe sound like it could be an insult but it's not he's just very odd you know eccentric eccentric Eccentric. he's made he's made enough money off of the cuckoo's egg that you could probably call him eccentric yeah good for him (laughs) <laughs> you yeah, gotta have enough money to be eccentric. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's absolutely. true. It's true. Yeah. If you're poor, you're just a weirdo. So you're just living in a box. <laughs> just living in a box down on the corner. Yeah. Plus, you got to have a little bit of money to be able to build your own uh, robot to <laughs> fetch your Klein bottles. Oh, I'm sure uh, there's somebody out there on the internet that like builds robots out of junkyards. Just like you could do it for free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we'll get letters. Well, like uh, the, uh, uh, well, this is getting way off topic, but we're still under time. So what the hell? Um, <laughs> there, there's a, a band called um, Captured by Robots. And it was uh, started by this guy who was initially in Skank and Pickle. If you remember this oh, band snap. from the Oh, 90s. yeah. But he, he made a, he built an entire band live band out of pneumatic robots i forgot about that dude i do remember that man i'm talking is wild when i say a robotic band each robot actually plays their instrument the guitar player actually plays the guitar drummer bass player he's got three Chuck E. Cheese animatronic robots that play horns. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still ska? No, it's like thank God, thank God. It's like it's like uh, metal with like a few little ska elements thrown in here and there. Um, but it's yeah. a crazy. I saw him play uh, years ago in a really tiny club where you could, you know, like I was like right up next to him because the stage was only like a foot tall. And it was insane it's because bonkers, he has a whole, like a full band, not just like a three piece rocking band, but like keyboard player, guitar, horns, drummer. And then he also played guitar. And his whole premise was that these robots captured him and enslaved him and forced him to play in this band. Uh, and it, he's on the Clifford Stoll nerd level, like that. Oh a, yeah. Well, he, and he, if you, he, they can his, hang out. He also plays guitar and he sings, and he has uh, some switches on his guitar. It's like he can flip a switch, and he talks into the microphone. But when he flips the switch, it modulates his voice to make him sound like a robot, and it makes the other guitar, like the guitar playing robot its head moves and lights up in time with whatever he's saying so that it looks like the robot is talking by God. And it, and I, he learned, I saw an interview with him. He said that he just decided he wanted to learn how to do that. And so he found the information on YouTube. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, that's uh, a lot of the stuff you can do. <laughs> yeah, look it up Man. on YouTube. Clifford Stoll did not have the benefit of YouTube, which does make it more impressive. It? Yeah, absolutely. And makes me wonder if he has a YouTube channel now. Oh, that's a good question. He might. There would be some interesting stuff on there. I wonder if you can see the see the robot. He apparently does have a website where you can order his Klein bottles, and it, I'm pretty sure it just has his home phone number on there. <laughs> boxes and boxes. He's so up, upside down on these things. <laughs> it's like, I gotta sell these fucking bottles. How do you even market it? <laughs> it, it doesn't... It it can't hold liquid because it doesn't have an inside or an outside. <laughs> <laughs> the hardest sell. Um, but they are interesting. Um, yeah. So anyway, that uh, that wraps that up. That's the story of Clifford Stoll, super nerd. Um, <laughs> thanks for uh, listening, Josh. I'm glad that you were here this week. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be along. It's fun. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, we'll Yay. see if we can make it a regular thing. It's it's a scheduling issue because capitalism demands that we all have uh, jobs. So until yeah. we write a, until we track down a, a hacker and write a book about it. And then, oh my god, you, know, you think anybody's the- ever done that before? <laughs> no. I don't know. But it'd be <laughs> I'm thinking go- about, hey, check this out. Now we're going to buy up all those Klein bottles and we're going to mark them up and sell them. Oh. So- because we've got a marketing platform here, so ah, oh, uh, there we go. You know, yeah. the, it's just we're leaving money on the table. <laughs> well, we'll stamp a CIA files logo on them. Junk. Cliff stole Klein bottles. All right, right. Listen, guys, the go uh, to our website now to buy. That's what I'm saying. If you want to see this happen, go to our website ciafiles.net, where you can also find links uh, for our information. And um, find the button there that says "Buy me a coffee." Buy us a coffee or a uh, coin bottle. Yes, and if you want us to be able to skate to escape the surly bonds of capitalism <laughs> and wage slavery, then you know dona donate some of your wages to us and live vicariously through us. Uh, whenever we don't have to have a real job yeah Yeah. uh also on the website you know we've got our merch uh store is linked there so you can get yourself a t-shirt coffee mug etc and uh follow us on the socials twitter.com uh at cia files podcast uh instagram at cia files and facebook.com slash cia files um, and like I said, you know, we've been mentioning this before, uh, Halloween rise of mammon, mammon rises and, uh, it's going to get sloppy. Do you, do you think, I don't, uh, cause we're still like remoting in, so I don't know how sloppy it'll get. I'm like metaphysically sloppy. Ooh, that sounds spooky. We're going to get into metaphysics over on uh rise of mammon we'll get into all of that this is gonna be Um, fun but yeah uh as always uh keep your bellies full keep your heads on a swivel um and whatever other old-timey advice you can think of and uh (laughs) we will see you later bye-bye later